Hello, everyone. Let me share my screen. Uh, all right. Can you see it? It mesh. Uh, yes, yes. All right. I okay. Thank you. Yeah, I assume you can see. So today, um, I'd like to talk about uh, data mesh architecture, which becomes uh, pretty popular uh, recently. So it's really trendy, and yeah. So we'd like to review the main concept and uh, uh, review one of the case study I'm working on uh, currently. All right. Uh, just two sounds uh, two, two words about uh, myself. So I'm a data architect at SoftSurf. Uh, yeah, in data engineering world since uh, 2005, and I also have a uh, blog uh, where I, uh, from time to time, uh, posting some uh, hope uh, interesting materials <laughs> from my site. And yeah, I have two articles related to data mesh. And interesting is that the first one was actually kind of uh, criticism about data mesh, and now I'm just <laughs> uh, am rather a promoter of um, this um, uh, approach. Uh, all right, so if you're talking about uh, agenda, as they said, so first we'd like to review the main uh, concept principles uh, of the data mesh architecture, uh, and then like information, like like in pretty in a good level of details, uh, the case study I'm uh, working on currently. So data mesh architecture. Uh, so uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, to talk about this uh, briefly historical perspective, just to understand uh, when it uh, come to the market and uh, why, it, like, and when it uh, and actually became uh, popular. So uh, I am actually data architect. So, and uh, I'm my main area of expertise is building a data solutions and, uh, uh, which majority of them were like uh, data analytics, yeah, data warehousing, data lakes, uh, lake houses. And uh, I like the slide just to show you the level of maturity of some approaches and technologies. So for example, if you're talking about data warehousing, like uh, uh, concept and approaches, they are on the market since like beginning of 19th, which is already uh, more than uh, 30 uh, years. So uh, this, this approach is really matured and we have a lot of technologies and uh, started like from the relational world. Now we have uh, MPP, massive parallel, uh, a lot of different engines. So uh, I would say data warehousing is something which is really uh, one of the most mature uh, like solutions and architectures and uh, approaches on the market. Then at some point in time when uh, big data and distributed uh, storages uh, come uh, to uh, to the market to the play like we started the era of uh, data lakes which is uh, kind of not uh, they not uh, change like um, i would say they not uh, replace data warehousing but rather extended it by some like additional features and possibilities uh, to store uh, like uh, really a big volumes uh, of data and not necessarily well structured. Yeah. And uh, just recently we have a lake house uh, like uh, concept, which is kind of marrying two worlds like data warehousing uh, plus data lakes. And we're trying to, to achieve two characteristics main, like uh, on the one hand, it is like distributed and uh, like really well scaled big data, like similarly to data lakes. Uh, on the other hand, they trying to have the best uh, features, like best um, abilities from the data warehousing world uh, related to well structured uh, schemas and uh, like support to some extent uh, transactions and um, uh, updates, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, sometimes you can see, and even yesterday I saw on some of the conference some people like putting data mesh a row to this one, but I don't do that because data mesh it's not about 
types of analytic storages. Uh, no, it's rather about organizing the uh, like the scope, the structure uh, to um, it's it, it's more about organizational and data governance approach, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't place uh, data mesh as something similar to data warehousing, data lakes, lake house, because this, uh, these uh, technologies are more about how to store data and how to analyze it. Yeah, so a uh, data mesh, it's more about decentralization and, uh, and uh, about like data governance, like a, a, a approach for uh, like managing the data. So, and um, actually data mesh just, um, uh, like came to the market just uh, recently, I would say, relatively in comparison to other technologies. So like since 2019. And now uh, this approach, this decentralized approach is pretty, become, yeah, uh, pretty popular on, on the market. Yeah, if you have questions, yeah, quick questions, yeah, you can interrupt me. All right. Um, and yeah, quick questions you can interrupt. And yeah, if you like something to discuss more philosophical kind of things, yeah, we can leave to the end. So uh, what is data mesh? So uh, let's review the main concept. Data mesh is about, as I said, a decentralized ownership of the analytical data. Yeah, so actually it is kind of similar things to, um, uh, microservices architecture, but in the world of data analytics. Yeah, so the whole idea is to split the scope of analytics into domains, business domains, and inside those domains we have yeah certain amount of data products. Yeah, we can uh, we will talk about uh, them in details uh, more. So, like those hexagon uh, are usually um, used to reflect the data products. Yeah. And uh, so that we have this split it into pieces, but on the other hand, we still treat the whole plat like this platform as one whole things, uh, which could be treated as mesh of interconnected data products. Yeah, and uh, in addition to that, uh, on top of it, in order not to have a mass, yeah, so we have a data governance, federated data governance uh, with a set of standards and rules like applied to uh, this uh, domains and products. And in the bottom, we have a platform which provides set of interfaces for data products. We'll talk about that in a little bit uh, more detailed way. Yeah, just on the next slides. So um, if you're talking about, uh, let's talk about platform. So platform, as I said, provides a common capabilities to according to the data mesh architecture. Uh, so that new business domain and new data products could be built and yeah, like all the necessary resources uh, could be provisioned. And uh, this uh, is mainly, uh, here we are mainly talking about storage and data processing engines like ETL, streaming pipelines, etc. And uh, yeah, so this is mainly about storage, all kinds of codes uh, to work with the data, and uh, yeah, all everything related to pipelines and uh, orchestration as well. So this is like main. Uh, all, all these capabilities should be provided by data platform, and uh, when uh, and it uh, so it, it should be built in a way so that we could provision new data products in a relatively uh, yeah simple and convenient way. Uh, in addition to that, like to the data platform, uh, turn back a little bit uh, to this uh, governance things. Yeah, so federated uh, computational. Uh, governance. So, uh, uh, like as I said before, like from the organizational perspective, the whole data mesh is like one whole. But 
this whole could be treated as a federation. Yeah, so we have uh, different members of this federation, which should be properly governed. Yeah, so, and if you're talking about uh, governance, so here we're talking about like set of standards and global policies, uh, which are applied on top of those uh, data mesh. And, uh, and here, like, we need like federated governance is kind of possibility to balance between autonomy of each uh, uh, domain, yeah, uh, versus like applying the global rules. Yeah. So here it's uh, up to organization or up to uh, yeah architects how to build it in a way so that we have this well uh, balanced uh, governed approach. Yeah not to push everything from the top down to this uh, business domain. And on the other hand, not to allow full autonomy of each part. Yeah, so here, like we need to, uh, to balance so that we have really uh, well governed solution while allowing the good level of autonomy. And uh, is the next part we will talk about uh, data product. So what, what does it mean a data product? So data product is a piece of like, data analytics, which has the following properties. So first of all, it should be valuable on its own. And uh, according to the author of a data mesh architecture, yeah, probably I haven't put it, uh, yeah, maybe at the very beginning is Jamak Dengani. Um, she uh, like pay a lot of attention to it. So a data product should be uh, valuable. It's not something intermediately, intermediate state of data or something like that, but there should be a clear purpose of each individual data product. Yeah. Um, it should be uh, like, since we like potentially a uh, solution built on top of data mesh architecture could contain uh, like pretty big amount of data products. So it is really important uh, to implement uh, discoverable yeah, property. So that like when a person which uh, like try to find some data, uh, she or he should be should find the data product. Yeah? So should should discover that it really exists and understand what is inside this data product. Yeah. So uh, it is important to uh, to put on, on top of data product like good amount of metadata. Uh, and now uh, maybe you heard the, the term data catalog. Yeah. Which also. Uh, Important, which is really important part of the data management infrastructure. When we have a data catalog with describing all the metadata about the uh, data, yeah. So what is inside, uh, like map to some business glossary, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, then, uh, like what is also important to be able to trust data product yeah and this uh, this uh, property could be achieved like using different approaches so for example data lineage yeah to to, to understand where the data come comes from yeah so what, what data sources uh, were used to build this data product and what what kind of data quality rules are applied etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah and um like addressable, it means uh, data products should be not something abstract, but something I can address, find, and query uh, when uh, when I need it. Yeah, to to get like a re request the proper data from it. And finally, interoperability and composability. Yeah. So, uh, as I said before, like we should be able to uh, to combine data from different data products just to. Uh, yeah, just to uh, to have a, a real good way to uh, to communicate and compose data from different data products. And uh, yeah, so and this uh, data product is so-called architectural quantum, like uh, called by Shemak Dengani. So data product is is kind of a puzzle in the world of data mesh uh, architecture. So and in order 
to um, make this puzzle, the picture from this puzzle, we need to yeah, just uh, understand what are the input ports and output ports, how to communicate. Uh, communication goes between uh, data products. Uh, what is really important, discoverability, as I said before, and observability to understand uh, like uh, uh, how the things are going inside the data product and uh, be able to yeah to control it via the common data platform. If we're talking about more uh, what is inside, uh, again a little bit more details about what is inside data product. So uh, actually, uh, it is like pretty simple. So main components are data, like different kinds of data set and code, you know, code which is like logic for transformation, enrichment, maybe machine learning models. Yeah, so they should be a part of the data product itself. Yeah, so, and this is important because um, often like in classical centralized architectures, uh, like the, the things are split. Yeah, so uh, we have, data warehouse, for example, yeah, so as, as a final destination, yeah, storage and a final destination, as there could be proper people responsible for like modeling and keeping the data warehouse in a good shape. And we have, we could have a separate team which is working just on pipelines, yeah, just on data transformations. And this, this team is like integration kind of team uh, which is responsible for integration, yeah, and these uh, like responsibilities could be split between teams, yeah. And uh, according to the data mesh, they try to avoid this approach. Uh, they uh, like usually uh, Jamak uh, are saying that uh, this approach could become a bottleneck uh, when, yeah. So we, we we can have narrow parts, yeah, in this uh, big uh, data flowing and storing. So. And uh, this approach instead is uh, like, as I said, the whole responsibility of getting the data, ingestion, onboarding, transformation, preparing data model, delivering to the target state, everything should be covered inside data product. It's part of the data product and one team is responsible for that. Yeah. So this is kind of a difference between centralized and decentralized approach. And yeah, so besides the code, metadata and configuration, as, as well as uh, like uh, references and specification about each uh, part of the infrastructure should be used. Um, all right, a couple more. Uh, if you're talking about serving, like how we serve data out of the data product, the idea is that like the data set yeah, so is main one of the main values of the data product could be served in a different way. Yeah, so different output ports or exposure mechanism could be or should be supported. Yeah, so for example, it could be exposed via just SQL interface. It could be some like um, pop up, yeah, like publish and subscribe kind of communication between other products. Uh, or as a way of uh, output ports. Yeah. So this is uh, like also uh, like important part because once we are building this in decentralized manner, we really need to uh, to to be sure that we provide good amount of interfaces to serve the uh, to serve the data properly. And uh, also, it is referenced by by the author by the Jamax that. Uh, like according to yeah to her philosophy, data product similarly to the classical analytical storage yeah should be able to provide like both historical data and like current state of data yeah so and uh, so called uh, the she used also so called the term uh, by temporal data so it means like like we should be try to be able to store different um, aspects of the timing. Yeah, so at so at least uh, to store like for example, if you're talking about some transactional when the event like actually occurred and when 
uh, it was onboarded on our data platform, yeah, just to have more flexibility in terms of analyzing and yeah, understanding um, how the data is flowing and when the events actually occurred. And uh, to have possibility uh, to analyze point in time data. So uh, just to, uh, to be able to see the state of the data at particular point in time. Yeah, so, but again, this is uh, actually nothing new, just usual approach for classical uh, data analytic storage. So yeah, just, just, just again, to underline that it's, it's not a new concept from in terms of data storages, modeling and uh, other approach, but it's just about organizing the way we, uh, we store data and uh, approach it. And, own, own it. And one of the yeah, last thing in this um, part of the presentation is, uh, uh, is the concept of domain archetypes. So all the data domains and uh, actually if you talk about domain and like for, 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 uh, data products which are stored inside those do uh, domains could be split in three categories like first one so-called source aligned uh, data which is usually um, using the data as a source from external data sources yeah so here you have on the picture like product and just payments and ful fulfillments yeah so they are using uh, uh, data from external uh, data sources and inside there could be like some transformation and valuable things. But the main idea is that they are built on top of source data and actually usually are limited by one data source. Then we have intermediate uh, aggregate uh, domain data, which put some additional value uh, on these source aligned uh, domains. Yeah, so for example, machine learning model, which could be built on top of one or more than one yeah, data product, or master data uh, pr products, which are like intended to consolidate data from a couple of uh, different data sources. And finally, we have consumer aligned domain data, uh, which intended to serve particular uh, consumer. Yeah, so a set of consumer scenarios and usually they uh, could yeah, combine data from a couple of different uh, data products. Uh, all right, so that's briefly it about main concept of data mesh uh, architecture and here like some like brief summary um, which we could uh, review briefly. So if you compare like centralized ownership and decentralized ownership, yeah. So as, as I said, um, like like once data is uh, like migrated from source to target, there could be uh, like a centralized team responsible for target data, so one big team responsible for pipelines, and yeah, just another team, for example, for some dashboarding and visualization yeah so in in comparison to the, like uh, to this uh, traditional way which is not bad yeah so it just it just depends on on your needs yeah, and depends on the uh, organizational structure but uh, yeah just in comparison to this approach we have a data mesh we have split into business domain and inside each domain we could have like representatives of all these teams. Yeah. So um, then, if we talking about like uh, one monolith mo monolithic approach, when everything comes into some data platform and comes out of it, we have distributed approach. Yeah. So when each part has a good level of autonomy and could be uh, pretty self, should be and could be. Could be and should be a pretty self-sufficient, yeah. Part, mm, yeah. So technical in comparison to byproduct, it's just data and code as one unit I described before. Governance, it's not 
top-down, yeah, but combination and uh, federated computational uh, governance. Uh, then yeah, each product is responsible for sharing the data in a proper way. And uh, yeah, so from the infrastructure perspective, it's not fragmented, but yeah, rather integrated. So we have well-defined platform which are serving different data uh, products. All right, yeah, so that was a first part briefly about main concept of data mesh. And um, now I'd like to talk about a case study. I don't know, maybe you have some questions at this stage. Yeah, is there, first of all, thanks a lot for clarifying the concepts first. And uh, the question I got is, uh, is there a good rule of thumb on when this approach is applicable? Does it depend, for example, on the size of the enterprise? I suspect that uh, uh, smaller enterprises will not benefit from the centralized data structure just because they do not have enough people and enough data marts, is it? Right, right, <laughs> exactly. I would say one of the driver would be complexity and size. Yeah, so if you really see uh, like very complex infrastructure, a lot of pieces which are pretty autonomous, yeah, and like um, like enterprise have like different business department which is pretty self-sufficient they have as uh, their own like uh, data analyst and maybe even their own, uh, own like engineering teams so it's it, it's a good like uh, yeah candidate to be like yeah, split it and uh, yeah uh, served by data mesh if you have yeah smaller organization which is pretty straightforward uh, from the organizational perspective one uh, for example, data engineering team, with, which consists of, I don't know, uh, three, five people, is there no reason to split them between yeah, uh, yeah, five different domains yeah, for, and one person in each domain, yeah, so one engineer. So it, it's rather for bigger and complex uh, infrastructures, I would say, one, one of the key drivers. And I, I'll talk about that in, in, in just in a little bit. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, so maybe I, I, I won't take other questions because yeah, I just would like to make sure I go through my slides and then I hope we will still have some uh, time for questions. Um, so uh, case study. <clears throat> so this is a project I'm working already for like something like one year and a half. And from the business, uh, case perspective, so it's large enterprise company and challenges they come to us, uh, something like business struggling to gain access to data, like a lot of different data sources and uh, it's hard to combine data from those data sources. Yeah, and yeah, too many subsystems which are not really accessible. And uh, yeah, goal, it's rather high level, but yeah, so they like to become more data driven and be able to yeah, overcome these challenges, access the data, and to be like more um, so called yeah, democratized. Yeah, so to, to, to provide more uh, access to a lot of different people yeah, so that they could access data. And uh, yeah, on the other hand, consolidated business view like provides yeah, just one way to access data, to find it and yeah, be able to consolidate from different uh, data sources. Actually, uh, this part of the requirement uh, for me as a uh, kind of a person who worked on the centralized solution for many years, it, it, for me, it, it like, uh, it was a like usual thing. And initially I thought that, yeah, we, we just really need to build a centralized approach, classical data warehouse to be able to consolidate data from different uh, from different sites and different data sources. And yeah, that would be uh, like uh, happy, make happy uh, everyone. But once like we had like first iterations and I saw that, um, yeah, in fact, there are no really a value to build a big centralized storage because there are a lot of different uh, autonomous 
uh, teams and uh, departments, they they don't really need, uh, yeah, there's no really need to build a something big and centralized. So, yeah, I, I put some drivers here. So, uh, I'm saying that, like, what what like what is really important from the driver's perspective, it's like diversity of heterogeneous, uh, uh, heterogeneity and scalability in two main axes. Like first is organizational. Yeah, when you see a lot of different business units, um, variety of different data sources, which are really independent, a variety of different consumption scenarios. And what is really important, like these scenarios and data are pretty independent on each other, like uh, like and autonomous. Yeah, so they don't really depend on other parts. And also from the technological perspective, so um, like in, in, in this business use case, uh, in this actually yeah, case, uh, in this project, we don't have a one single technology to provide data analytics yeah so we have uh, we have a um, like a lot of like a lot of variety here so i have it on other slides but uh, like on the on the high level we need to build uh, we decided to build a analytics on top of azure cloud it's one big piece but on the other hand there a big sap ecosystem including sap bw like analytics on sap and these two platforms should coexist yeah so uh, they're like part of analytics should be done here and part of analytics should be done here and uh, there are no need to build yeah just to uh yeah one win versus another yeah, they, they, they should coexist and uh, also from interfaces to data so besides classical analytics, there should be a, like interface for data scientist, and there should be like possibility to uh, to do stewardship on the data yeah, to review manually and put some adjustments and consolidations, as well as data authoring. Yeah, so the classical way where a lot of Excel spreadsheets, which are not consistent and shared uh, between a lot of people, the, the uh, like intention is to replace those like entering data in millions of different excels but provide a like uh, user-friendly interface to enter the data which in turn will be part of, later on of the data analytics of the master data and uh, on top of that uh, uh, it was also required to have shared interfaces for discovery for, to discover data, yeah. So broad audience should access data and unified discovery mechanism. Yeah. Uh, besides that, like, uh, yeah, should be complete GDPR standard, well-defined method for collaboration and uh, yeah, increase the trust to the data. Yeah, so it's kind of classical uh, data management related uh, best practices should be applied. So that data is really well managed accessible to everyone and uh, yeah so convenient interface to find the data and to access it um all right so yeah so we started to do this data mesh implementation journey so and at the beginning we had to define what the data product is for us yeah for this particular uh, case yeah so for us as a company and uh, yeah, so I was working on definition of the data product, just what, what does it mean data product for us? Yeah. So, and uh, here, like I put together a, uh, yeah. So first of all, have like kind of context diagram. So what, what is data product in relationship to, um, to like to different aspects and things uh, outside of it? So first of all, it is like, part of some business domain and uh, properly once we have defined this business domain there should be defined yeah, some business glossaries and set of business terms in, inside it so that we could yeah link to our data product and defined it by this business glossary then uh, what's really important in uh, data mesh is about ownership so and here we we need to have 
assigned a data product owner, a like as well as data product engineering team. Yeah, so ideally, these both assignments should be long term. Yeah, so this ideal case when data product really understand the value of or data product owner understands the value of this particular data product, promotes promotes its value inside the organization or proper at least proper users, and uh, yeah keep track that everything goes uh, as expected. Yeah, and the uh, engineering team is also like uh, ideally would be like uh, a silent term assignment, and so that team once it uh, builds data product, it understands this business domain, it, it could maintain it properly, and yeah. Uh, so that yeah, this uh, like to manage it in more inefficient, more efficient way. And uh, besides that, yeah, data product is used to some data, like uh, uses data from either external data source or from other uh, data products. Yeah, and uh, besides that, yeah, as I said before, we need to clearly yeah define like technology profile used for this particular data product and what are global data governance policies which are uh, like uh, it should follow you know, each particular uh, data product and we, uh, if you go inside data product so what is important to define and yeah a lot of the things i already described uh, before uh, while the, the, the defining the concept so uh, we have data and we have code. Yeah. So, and in code, we have different uh, things related to transformations, cleansing, validations. Uh, everything should be part of the data product. Besides that, like, should expose possibility to discover the data product. And here we are talking about syntax, semantics, classification, sensitivity labels, and lineage. So what is the data uh, coming from and how internally it, it's been uh, going between different data sets. Uh, what is also important, uh, observability components, just to understand like different operational metrics. Yeah, so how often data is being uh, loaded, reloaded, incrementally loaded, uh, whether it's like successfully or not, and uh, different statistics about uh, data quality. And uh, what is also important, ideally, it would be good to understand how the data product is used inside the organization. Whether, like, uh, we we can we can state that it's really valuable, but if nobody uses it, yeah, it's a warning for us. Yeah, so something is wrong. So ideally, we we, we should also uh, track the uh, usability of each particular data product. So yeah, input and output ports, uh, data contract. Uh, which is also important yeah so we ideally we would need to support yeah so uh, data contracts yeah, specification what exactly we uh, expose and yeah technological profile and data governance policies so this this yeah once we have defined this like logical structure of the data product we can just implement it yeah so, and uh, as I said before, like if we're going uh, into details about implementation. So uh, I said before that we have like variety in terms of technology. So uh, here we can put uh, three main areas of, of technology profiles. So the first one, probably the biggest uh, one, is uh, using Delta Lake on Azure. So it's Synapse Analytics, which uh, with the use of Delta uh, file format. Uh, it's a yeah, pretty good thing. It's also pretty uh, popular right now. I won't uh, talk about that uh, too much, but yeah, just, just one technology profile on analytics on Azure. Then we have analytics using sub BW. And uh, we also have this management of master data. And uh, in order to do that, like separate master data management platform has been uh, bought. Yeah? So selected and bought. 
And you can see here, yeah, three technology profiles. And on each technology profile, we have certain amount of data product. And on top of it, we have data catalog, which ideally should scan all the data products across these technology profiles and certain rules on the uh, uh, yeah, governance perspective. All right, and here I just uh, was trying to, um, a little bit cumbersome diagram, but I uh, was trying to, uh, to reflect how the data product is, uh, looks like. Yeah, so here we have Delta Lake product. And um, here uh, at the bottom, we have services provided by the platform. Yeah, so here, uh, I don't know uh, how you are aware about services provided by Azure, but uh, here is the main one are like storage account. Yeah, so uh, we have classic medallion architecture, bronze, silver, and gold. So here are like storage accounts provided by the platform. And if we're talking about this projections to individual data product, so um, we are using inside each storage account, we have a separate containers. Yeah, so containers for like individual certain data product. Yeah. And similarly, um, we have a service called serverless SQL pool. It's kind of yeah, you know, from the logical perspective, it's kind of relational database. And for each individual data product, we have a separate instance of the database. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and yeah, it's a, it's a good way to uh, to show like the platform part, like service, and here are, like projections of instance of indi each individual data product. And then from the code perspective, we also have like Synapse, we're using Synapse Analytics and we have uh, Spark Notebooks and Pipelines. Uh, yeah, just organized in proper way in folders, uh, like for each, like with a code dedicated to each data product. We have configurations from the output port perspective. Uh, yeah, so mainly it's SQL connection and also, yeah, so we have also some uh, real time uh, real time scenarios when uh, the data is pushed to streaming data sites to Power BI so that the data could be reflected in Power BI perspective. So this is main parts, uh, data and code and transformations. And besides that, if you're talking about data discovery and observability, so we are using Azure service for data catalog called Microsoft Purview. And some of the governance features provided by Purview, which is actively developed now by Microsoft. And we also have like, if you're talking about data product projection, we have like inside Purview uh, also these uh, boundaries for each individual product. Yeah, so for example, we have pool review collection defined for each individual data product and yeah, proper business glossary, which later on is mapped to, uh, to the actual data. And from the observability perspective, it's something uh, which is pretty straightforward here. We're just using usual services provided by Azure for monitoring and storing the log of the pipelines and understand how the data is going, plus additional metrics, um, statistics stored in Delta Lake. Uh, on top of it, uh, we can use like uh, standard monitoring uh, tools plus yeah, Power BI dashboards. Uh, all right, we have 15 minutes uh, left. I'll try to speed up a little bit. And similarly, we have master data management data products, uh, which is kind of similar, but uh, in terms of data, it's used like classical relational database and inside uh, Azure SQL Server, separate instance of Azure databases are provisioned with the proper schemas. Uh, also some, uh, yeah, just uh, as a help, some storages and containers are used. And uh, yeah, just uh, more variety here in terms of uh, metadata and configuration. Some, some of them are provided by the Azure 
services on the portal and some of them provided by the market tool. And yeah, similar things about discovery and observability. So uh, Microsoft Purdue is able to scan this kind of data uh, as well. Uh, all right, if you're talking about communication input and output ports, so one of the main way to access data is just using SQL interface. So and SQL interface, it's really simplifies a lot of things. Uh, because it's easy to query from any uh, yeah, visual uh, like dashboarding or reporting tool. And then we have like also some collaboration with uh, ML oriented data products, like some uh, sending, pushing data, market based uh, snapshots. Uh, plus, in order to support some real time scenarios, uh, as I said before, some data is pushed into. Uh, streaming data sets. Yeah, in addition to that, some also just uh, web UI interface is provided, uh, for example, to query the data via SQL, uh, on like Synapse uh, workspace uh, gives us this ability, or web UI to review the master data in Samarki or web UI, yeah, just, just to view the actual reports. Uh, all right, the next part, just really briefly about data catalog. I said that we are using Microsoft uh, Purview, which is pretty uh, good uh, tool. And Microsoft in um, invest a lot of efforts into its uh, rapid development. So yeah, and Purview we are using for yeah just scanning different data source, data assets. We are using to build a business glossary, to classify the data, uh, to build a data lineage to the extent which Purview gives us. So uh, there is so-called procedure of uh, data certification. And they actually added recently the uh, meta model functionality when we can put additional metadata on top of data. Yeah, so and this this metadata, it's like ability, like it, it's a web interface where you can uh, put manually the information about uh, like to insert data about data product, which domains it belongs to, which data it uses for uh, for onboarding to provide certain attributes, uh, for example, who owns it, and put certain links to, yeah. To, to, to the dashboards and observability and discover uh, attributes like semantics. And uh, we can connect once we have defined this data product. So for example, sustainability, yeah, sustainability domain. And here we have energy management, so energy management. And here we can, this energy management link to the particular data set. So here a data set, so it, it could be, for example, yeah, tables in the database, yeah, storing the data about this energy management statistics. So everything is like this, all this metadata could be, uh, yeah, just properly configured inside Purview and connected between each other, which yeah, gives us a pretty good uh, functionality in regards of metadata anal um, an analysis. Uh, all right, just trying to, uh, to monitor timings, so data quality assurance. Yeah, it's pretty standard. I don't, uh, I, I won't concentrate a lot on it, uh, but just uh, to cover this area of discoverability and understand the data quality is uh, at the good levels. So data quality checks are inserted into each stage of the data processing, uh, and it is metadata driven. So it's actually implemented by a great, great expectation library, which is one of the popular on the market right now. And uh, all this uh, yeah, metadata is uh, stored actually in format of uh, JSON files. And analytics is built using the Power BI on top of uh, statistics gathered during this data quality assurance process. Uh, Angie, data... sorry, sorry, we have yep. a raised hand. Uh, perhaps uh, someone yep. has a question. Quick question. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah. Um, hi, Andre. Um, I, I know that we are uh, very short in time, but I will try to be as brief as possible. Uh, regarding that uh, data catalog, uh, can you can you please explain uh, what kind of um, data assets were you able to register in that data catalog? I think especially about something that is outside of the um, Azure or Microsoft uh, tech stack. So, for example, if we have some corporate data warehouse implemented uh, with the help of uh, Teradata or, or any other technology that already exists uh, in the enterprise, and we would like to catalog it as well in our uh, common business uh, data catalog. Yeah. yeah, good question. So I actually, as I said, Microsoft invests a lot into it. And uh, so they uh, actually added connector to yeah different uh, like technologies as you mentioned yeah just enterprise databases like oracle uh, teradata i'm not really i don't remember probably it's also supported and uh, yeah so for example currently we are working to onboard sub bw so they released sub bw connectors so uh like uh, we yeah just right now we are working on adding sub bw data into purview as well yeah besides this yeah, microsoft stack as you said mm -hmm. uh, okay so let me yeah let me finish yeah so probably i i'll use uh, five remaining minutes maybe if you have more time we can uh, yeah, stay a little bit longer and yeah, just discuss some questions. So data contracts is also important thing. So recently we introduced this concept of uh, data contract definition. So especially if you're talking about Delta Lake when the schema is not uh, well, it's well structured, but it's pretty dynamic and flexible. So there is a need to define the data contract so that everyone is aware uh, like what kind of data is served by data products. So, and we actually were trying to implement some uh, research and what we can use on the market, but decided to build a custom specification built on top of JSON uh, so that uh, this uh, specification is translated into set of uh, data quality checks, validating whether we really expose data according to the data contract. And on the other hand, this data contract is also transformed into the visual representation. So what, what, what kind of the data we are storing uh, along with the relationships and some uh, like uniqueness and yeah, primary keys constraints. Um, all right, so and uh, what is also important in data mesh is organizing the teams. Yeah, so actually this picture is um, is used from the Azure. There is a framework called Cloud Analytics. Um, don't remember the exact name. Uh, yeah, I have, sorry, I have here. Cloud Scale Analytics Framework. So uh, it's like best practice from the Microsoft, but uh, it, it really makes sense. And uh, like we implemented it uh, to the high extent. So actually the teams are split in a way so that we have a platform team, which is mainly about security and network isolation, things like that. Then we have a foundation team, which is responsible for the platform and like configuring those storage account, uh, services on Azure, uh, everything we really need to provision the data products. And then we have a, uh, actually we have two, uh, as of now we have two pretty mature teams, which is responsible for a set of different data products. They are pretty knowledgeable about the business domains they are responsible uh, for. And yeah, so they support a certain amount of data products. Yeah, in addition to that, we have data governance team, which is like cross-cutting concern on the, on the one hand, and on the other hand, data stewards assigned to certain uh, data products. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so, and that's briefly it. If to summarize like some uh, main benefits you know, of the data mesh, uh, I would say, it helps to manage 
complexity, like both organizational and technological, and via this decentralized ownership. It helps to build a data democratization via this data catalog so that everyone can go into this data catalog and find the proper data assets, data, data sets, and uh, understand how to access it. And yeah, just easier to scale, we could say. And what is important is this uh, concept of ownership. Like, so uh, we have this rule for data product, each data product should have their own data product owner. And this helps uh, a lot, yeah, just not to abandon some parts of the solution and uh, some of the data sets. And yeah, as I said, this uh, governance approach in general could help you balance between centralized rules versus autonomous way to uh, handle the things. And uh, what are the challenges? So uh, challenges, uh, a lot of experts, and I also feel this one, um, to put the proper domain distribution, yeah, just to split the data into the proper pieces, not too big, not too small, just balance them, not to uh, yeah, create additional um, obstacles, but really split them in a way so that everyone would be happy. And yeah, just structure engineering teams, like initially it was really a challenge now, like using this approach I showed you in the previous slide, it works pretty well, I would say. And uh, one of the challenge would be just, yeah, to share the common data. So, and I described this challenge in my first blog when I was uh, uh, saying that, yeah, data mesh is a lot of uh, challenges and pain points. So this one, if some dimensional data, kind of dimensional data, so for example, organizational structure, something like that, which is used by a lot of other data products, so that could be potentially a challenge, how to manage it uh, properly, but still, yeah, there are certain techniques how to do that, so in, in a separate, and now we, once we onboarded this master data management kind of data product that becomes a yeah, pretty good way to uh, to manage it, and yeah, that's uh, all from my side for today. Yeah, sorry, I, I took almost all the time. If you have, uh, yeah, a couple more minutes, we can yeah stay for some questions. And me, um, to what extent uh, data lineage uh, works in, in in this solution? Yeah, so it's a good, good, uh, good question. And yeah, I, I should have to put it into the challenge, but it's not challenge of data mesh, but rather, yeah, challenge in general in, in our current world of technology. Yeah. So it, it works pretty well. So for example, is this Microsoft Purview have good level of support for the data lineage, but if you're talking about Microsoft to Microsoft, yeah, so if you are using Azure pipelines, like Azure Synapse pipelines or Azure Data Factory, it works really perfect. Uh, but if you're using different kinds of uh, integration, yeah, so even Spark notebooks, that becomes more challenging. So, uh, but Purview also allows to manually put these connections, so which also helps to some extent, but this is still the area I would like uh, yeah, I would be happy to improve on my project and uh, to have in general some good tools, do, tools for that. Was was it to an extent it integrated with data consumption tools like I don't know Power BI, for example? Mm -hmm. This is poor view has support of uh, of this uh, like references yeah it, it it gives this possibility to visualize these references microsoft purview and purview supports also power bi so we could track like for each uh, power bi data set like where the data came from as well so potentially i could uh, pick up one of the uh, power bi dashboards uh and uh, the column on this dashboard and track it down uh, to the uh, source yeah. system, right? Right. Okay, that's that's a great capability. 